Thank you, brother. Dear friends in the Dhamma, uh, I'm so delighted to be here in uh, BGF uh, for this Dhamma sharing. And uh, so it happens to be uh, the new moon day, right? Uh, so it's really a nice day for us to uh, reflect and then um, uh, listen to some Dhamma and then um, uh, go into our topic, you know, to discover, uh, to be happy within. Um, so the full moon days and the new moon days uh, are important days in the Buddhist tradition uh, to, uh, to break away from our ordinary you know, daily activities uh, and then uh, uh, look back and, and reflect. Because if you do not stop, pause and reflect, we don't know exactly where we are going. So uh, traditionally, uh, we had uh, this full moon day and also the new moon days where people will um, stop their normal day-to-day -day activities and they will uh, dedicate uh, more time uh, to learn uh, and meditate and reflect on the teachings of the Buddha. Even um, nowadays, um, in um, countries like you know, Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, uh, people uh, spend their whole day uh, in temples. And uh, in Sri Lanka, the full moon days uh, are holidays. So, all to, so, you already have 12 holidays because there are 12 full moon days. <laughs> and then in addition to that, <laughs> there are you no know, independent day and then, you know, uh, Sri Lanka New Year day and then, you know, and also very other religions also like uh, there are like Good Friday, Christmas day and then um, yeah, for Islam religion also. I think Sri Lanka had more than 20 uh, <laughs> days you know, as the national holidays. Uh, one of the, uh, the most number of holidays, you know, uh, so because you get 12 full moon days as holidays, you don't have to work. Um, so so the, you can, you don't have to work and you can, uh, uh, you are supposed to come to temple <laughs> and uh, follow the eight precepts. Uh, and then I spend that day as a reflective day. Uh, but not all <laughs> Buddhists are doing that. Uh, but uh, many, many are doing that. Uh, and definitely every month is a special day for all. New Moon Day is usually, it's not a holiday, <laughs> uh, but many old people will come to temple early in the morning and they will observe eight precepts and they'll spend the whole day and also the night. They will leave uh, the temple the next day. They will sleep in the hall, you know, uh, because you know, when you observe eight precepts, you are not going to use luxurious beds and you know uh, chairs, and therefore you will simply, you know, sleep uh, uh, with, with mats, you know, in the temple in the big hall, and the next day morning they will leave. So anyway, so having a day to stop and then reflect is a very important um, practice that we had in our Buddhist traditions, then we will not be off track, you know, from our practice. And then we will always reflect and realign, you know, reorient ourselves <laughs> to the Dharma path because of that practice. Um, anyway, so uh, that is also helping us to find you know, the true happiness. Um, so it's to start our topic on happiness within and versus without. I would like to start with the interesting story that we can find uh, in the suttas. Uh, in well, there's one interesting incident happened uh, as re uh, recorded uh, in the sutta called Kali Godha Sutta uh, in the um, connected discourses or kindred discourses, and there was a uh, the, the monk called Badhya, but he was, uh, he had an additional uh, uh, name called Kali Godha Badhya because he came from the area called Kali Godha. And he was originally from a warrior ca caste and he was uh, uh, also a prince. Uh, and then after listening to the teachings of the Buddha and then he was really impressed and uh, he had, you know, some uh, deep uh, realization. And so he wanted to, you know, live his uh, royal life and became a monk. And uh, so he was practicing with other monks in the monasteries and particularly in the groves. Those days there were, you know, a lot of 
grows like uh, uh, is there are also monasteries but mainly you know uh, make like a bamboo grove and you know other growth um, so this monk <coughs> had a special habit you know whenever he went into uh, uh, under, uh, under a tree and after he meditated for some time he uh, have exclamations he will just you know, say uh, certain praises and that praise is re recorded in the Pali as Aho Sukhang Aho Sukhang you know, Sukha is the term for happiness so if you translate that you know it's like uh, what a bliss so this monk has a habit of you know uh, uh, saying this quite often you know whenever he sat, sat under a tree after some time he will, he will say this out loud what a bliss what a bliss you know, what a bliss aho sukhang aho sukhang and all the other monks got curious about it you know why this monk always you know utter this uh, praise what a bliss and what a bliss they were curious and they all you know talk among each other you know have you heard that monk you know saying this praise and the yes, yes, I have also heard about it. So there was a whole, you know, conversation, discussion about this monk's special habit. And they really, you know, suspected why he has to say this. And some suspected, you know, because, uh, because he, they all knew that he was from in this royal family. They all thought that maybe he's missing, you know, his uh, royal life. And so whenever he remember, you know, kind of luxuries and all the comforts he had in his royal palace, now he doesn't have. He see, he, he sit under a tree and he has a very simple, you know, lodgings and uh, he just ate, you know, whatever people offered him, you know, mostly he go for, you know, pinta pata and so maybe he's missing all the, the luxuries he had. Maybe thinking about it, he may be, you know, uh, saying this. What a bliss, <laughs> what a bliss. And so they all felt sorry about this, this you know, uh, the monk. And they actually reported to the Buddha. Venerable sir, we think that this monk needs some help <laughs> because he always saying this, you know, <laughs> what a bliss and what a bliss. Uh, maybe you should, you know, help him. And um, of course, with you know, Buddha's experience and with this, you know, uh, deep uh, understanding, Buddha knew what is really happening. So, but Buddha wanted to make uh, this an, as an opportunity to, you know, teach a lesson for other monks too. So instead of, you know, talking to that monk individually, what Buddha did, he summoned all the monks in that monastery and then also asked this monk to come. So in front of the, all the monks, <laughs> and now Buddha is questioning this monk. Okay. I have heard that you have this habit of, you know, repeating this praise very often, uh, what a bliss and what a bliss, what a bliss. Is that true? And he said, yes, Venerable Sir, I quite often <laughs> repeat this praise. Okay, now can you explain why you are uttering this praise very often? Then in front of all the other monks, this monks report to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, when I was a prince uh, and I was in the palace and uh, my uh, chamber was guarded by a, a guard outside and my palace was guarded by few other guards around the palace, security people. And then even outside of the you know, palace, there were more other security guards. So I was protected by many security guards even though i had so many security guards to protect me when i go to sleep when the bus i couldn't sleep well because you know there were competitors you know and there were other you know um, um, the competed, competed, competing uh, princess to the throne so there was i was always afraid of being attacked or being you know uh, th threatened and moreover that, I also had a lot of other responsibilities I was assigned. Uh, and, the, and, and also uh, my father is also quite afraid of a lot of spies. 
because those days, you know, kingdoms, you know, were not protected. There were no like, you know, United Nations and, you know, there were no sovereignty. You know, if you are powerful, you can simply go and you know, conquer other country. So there were a lot of spies were there. So I lived a life of, you know, stress and tension. And, and, uh, and although I have so many guards around me, it was not a happy life. It was a life of, you know, um, insecurity and it was a life of threat. When a person now, since I renounced, you know, my, you know, royal life, and now I am not going back and claiming my, you know, uh, my rights to the throne. And I am now free. And now I rely on very simple needs. And when I sit under this tree with, without all these burdens on my head, without all this, you know, feeling of fear and threats around my head, I feel such a release. And whenever I was able to uh, meditate well, whenever I was able to uh, uh, settle my mind and tranquil my mind, I feel such a deep relaxation and relief in my body and mind. So I, that joy, that bliss I never experienced, even though I had such a comfortable bed, comfortable you know, uh, luxuries in that palace. So Venerable Sir, the reason for me to say what a bliss, what a bliss, is actually to, actually to rejoice this freedom, this bliss, and particularly this joy that coming within me, with, with, the, with this meditative joy, the relaxation of the muscles, relaxation of the, of the mind that I experience. So that is why, Venerable Sir, I am repeating this phrase, what a bliss, <laughs> what a bliss. So all the other monks who thought that he may be missing the, his previous luxuries, you know, they were able to overcome their misunderstanding. What he is referring as Sukha, or the bliss of happiness, is not the happiness that he, he had in the palace, but actually the new happiness, new found happiness that he is enjoying in his new life as a monk. So then Buddha explained to the monks that, you know, that is the kind of happiness that you can develop that is not relying on anyone else, that is not dependent on anyone else, but that is something that you can independently develop within you. And this monk have experienced that happiness and it is, it is because he's experiencing uh, it um, um, as a new experience, he was really, you know, uh, enjoying it and appreciating it. And then he's, uh, he's uh, saying it to enjoy that happiness. So all the monks were able to understand what is going on. So can we exclaim like that, what a bliss, what a bliss. <laughs> and uh, do, you, do you remember, you know, any moment in your life that you had that, you know, that, you know, expression, oh, what a joy, <laughs> what a happiness. Do you remember such a moment? I mean, we, we should have some moments in your life, right? And, and you had such a, you know, such an expression. I mean, doesn't has to be, you know, like, you know, uh, this Baddiya monk, but any moment in your life, the, you had such an experience. Anyone remember? Hmm? Yes, maybe, maybe like simple things like maybe reunion with your family, <laughs> right? That could be one simple, you know, joy. Uh, maybe a moment that you were able to, you know, uh, visit a temple. Maybe a moment that you were able to do a meritorious deed, right? Um, I don't know. It's Maybe in the moment that, how about, you know, when you go for a vacation? Maybe, you know, maybe when you went to you know, Langkawi, were you able to say, oh, what a joy, <laughs> what a joy. You can, you know, but of course, simply being in Langkawi will not enough. <laughs> there are other conditions has to be fulfilled, right? Maybe you plan in this vacation with your family, with your friends, and then you, you know, uh, uh, dedicated so many other things and we, 
you can go as a group. Uh, but when you reach Lankavi, maybe you can have a disagreement and arguments and start, you know, um, some um, <laughs> uh, uh, disappointments and, and then we may lose that joy. But if you know how to handle and maintain even the disagreements, maybe you'll be able to enjoy that environment. Yeah. So, so that the praise, the expression by Venerable Bhatia Vata Bliss, can help us to understand um, there is a kind of happiness that we all can develop within ourselves. But it may be very different from the usual happiness, the usual uh, pleasure that we are very familiar with. So the, the normal ordinary happiness that we all you know, uh, experience most often is called Kama Sukha. The happiness that is, or the pleasure uh, that we derive, that we receive uh, from our sensory organs. Whenever we encounter very pleasant sensory object, uh, and we get a pleasure, we get a happiness, and, and it is a happiness, and uh, we Buddha call it Kama Sukha. Uh, you may have experienced that Sukha very often. Maybe even today, right? Uh, you know, whenever you get a, a nice, nice vision, a nice visual object, and something that you really like to see, and whenever you get the opportunity to, to see that, and maybe a nice smell, you know, your most, you know, um, um, uh, like your your preferred fragrance, right? Uh, and if you had the, got the opportunity to have that. Or maybe your favorite music. And when you get the opportunity to hear that, yeah, it is really joyful and pleasurable. And then maybe your favorite food. Maybe, you know, this is durian season, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you get the best, you know, <laughs> uh, the brand of durian. You know, maybe, maybe when you get the opportunity to go to, you know, uh, best and favorite restaurant. So whenever you get the opportunity to have the pleasurable, uh, maybe uh, the pleasant object, sensory object, and then you get the pleasure, you get the happiness. That is called Kama Sukha. And so when the Buddha talked about this Kama Sukha, definitely he has not praised Kama Sukha very much, but he has not denied the, uh, the, the satisfaction, the pleasure that we can get from that. But the only thing uh, with regard to sensual pleasure, the ordinary happiness that we uh, enjoy most of the time, is that uh, there are a number of issues <laughs> with regard to this uh, happiness. One, any you know, happiness that we get through our sensory uh, organs are temporary, fleeting. We cannot hold into that happiness too long. Even though you go to your best restaurant, and you, even though you get the best, your favorite food, how long you can enjoy that? You cannot keep eating all the day. Right? Uh, it is temporary. Even though it's your favorite food, when you keep eating that for some time, you, we ourselves get fed up with that. We can only enjoy that food only to a certain period of time. And after a while, we get uh, fed up with that and we will look for another taste. Same with all other sensory pleasure. So the issue is that, that, that sensual, the happiness that we get from sensory pleasure is, is exciting. It's, you know, it's elation, it's, you know, upliftment in a way. But we cannot keep hold into that. It's very temporary. And on, on sometimes we cannot, uh, those objects are fleeting too. You know, our pleasurable objects doesn't stay too long. Even our favorite food, if you keep it too long outside, can get rotten. <laughs> and any other sensory objects also place in. And either it, it, they are uh, uh, changing uh, themselves or our interest, our liking to them will also get changed. Therefore, that is the problem. We cannot hold into that happiness too long. 
It's too fleeting. So that's one issue with that. And second issue with that is actually because of their fleeting and we cannot, you know, fully satisfy it. Um, uh, and the other, other issue is, is actually because we had to rely on other people and other things for this happiness. Uh, any sensual pleasure is not completely under our control. Uh, we, other people and other conditions, other factors has to be perfect. <laughs> you know, to have a really nice sensual pleasure. Many other conditions have to be perfect. Even though we have, you know, and, uh, and so, so it's all relying on other conditions, other people. Uh, and even like, you know, like good praises that you get, you know, and compliments we get from others. It's a, it's a nice, pleasurable, happy experience, right? But you have to wait until other people compliment you. It's all up to others. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, under our control. So we cannot fully control it and we all have to rely. We are at the mercy of other people and other things when it comes to our happiness of sensual pleasure. So what Buddha is saying that actually these are nice, but they are limited and, and there are some issues. And there's a special praise by the Buddha. The Buddha said that sensual pleasures are appasado, that means they have little satisfaction, but bahu adino. There are many uh, consequences. It has a pleasure, it has a satisfaction, pleasure, happiness, but it is little. But in order to get the little happiness, we have to sacrifice a lot. We have, there are so many, you know, uh, burdens we have to take uh, to get that little satisfaction. So many burdens, so many uh, uh, labor, so many, you know, stress we have to, you know, uh, go through in order to get that little satisfaction. In addition to that, there's also other issues that is, uh, we can get addicted to the sensual pleasures. Addicted means actually, um, because we, are, we will not be fully satisfied with that and we can keep, we try to, you know, get that satisfaction again and again. And then sometime, uh, once you get the satisfaction with certain sensual pleasure, and the next time you, you, you eat the same thing, you will not get the same satisfaction, then you have to increase the dose. <laughs> yeah, and then initially you were so happy when you had that smell, and the next time you didn't get the same satisfaction, so you have to increase the dose. The, when you listen to the beautiful, nice song, music for the first time, you are so happy, so elated, and next time you listen to the same song, you didn't get the same level of satisfaction, then you have to increase the dose. And we had to keep increasing the dose more and more and more and more. The more we increase the dose, the more the, our satisfaction goes down. As a, res, as a result, we can get addicted and there can be uh, so many other problems with, with regard to that. And then uh, sometime because of our addiction and we can, we may also end up being doing a lot of unethical behavior, immoral behavior, even we, we may commit bad karma to have a little sensual pleasure. So therefore, Buddha do not, you know, deny that there are there's a satisfaction, happiness, and pleasure uh, that we can get from our sensual pleasures, but is simply limited. And but what Buddha wanted us to understand is that as human beings, we have a capacity to have to to experience more deeper levels of happiness and joy. So therefore, we should not limit ourselves only to one kind of happiness, which is the most common type of happiness, what we call the happiness of sensual pleasure. And that is the most common and most ordinary. But as human beings, we are capable of more than that. So what Buddha is saying that you have right to have a better happiness, to have a more deeper levels of happiness, more enduring level of, uh, levels of happiness than this. 
So what Buddha is helping us to understand and inviting us is to don't limit yourself to this very meager, very uh, base, very primary levels of happiness. Try to go beyond that. And those are the, the happiness that we can develop, not too much relying on other people or other conditions, but something that we can uh, genuinely develop within ourselves. So I'm going to share with you some <coughs> uh, uh, other, that other happinesses that we can develop. <coughs> the one <coughs> can be called actually a happiness of generosity. Happiness or generosity. Of course, you can have a pleasure when you eat something really delicious. But how about the happiness you will get when you are able to share that delicious meal with someone else? When you see the other person also enjoying what you prepared, what you cook, or what you, you know, bought for them. When you see some, so how someone else is relieving the hunger because of you know you were offering you were gift. When you see that, there's a different happiness, and that happiness is somewhat under your control, somewhat, uh, because uh, because you are doing it. Whenever you want, you can try doing it. You know, sometimes we may have to have something to give, but you know there are many ways to share and give. But that is a kind of happiness, but it is not exactly the same as happiness that we get from our sensual pleasures. Because the happiness we get sensual pleasures has this, this um, the, uh, aspect of excitement, the, the, uh, the aspect of elation. But the happiness you will get as a result of generosity, sharing and giving, may not have that level of excitement but it has more enduring, more peaceful, more steady state of joy. So it's not as you know, uh, active or excitement, but actually it has more enduring, more steady state of uh, contentment. So therefore, the, the happiness that we can develop within ourselves has a different quality. Do not expect they will have excitement like, you know, when you, uh, you know, get something really pressurable. Um, but, but it is more steady, more enduring. So there is happiness of, you know, generosity. And, uh, and whenever you are able to share and give and you know, maybe share whatever thing that you really you know, like, um, one time I was able to, you know, I, I had a nice uh, uh, slippers, you know, nice slippers, and it was really comfortable. And uh, so when I visited one monastery and the uh, one other monk uh, saw my slipper and he, he really liked it, the color and everything, and he even tried that. And he said, oh, this is very comfortable. And I thought that, how wonderful, you know, and if this, and he says, he's, he's saying that this is very comfortable. And I thought that, oh, this is a great opportunity. I, I told that monk, oh, Venerable Sir, I got a new pair of shoes because I had, you know, unused pair of shoes, you know, uh, not sure, pair of, you know, slippers given to me by you know, um, devotees. So, so if, because he, this monk really liked this, you know, slippers, although I used it for a few times, but I decided that this is a good opportunity for me. So I asked him, I request, I, I begged him, you know, Venerable Sir, please, please take this shoe and use it. I am really happy if you can do it because I have another pair that I can use. So he happily took it. That gave me such a joy. I was so happy all along the way back to my temple. And I, then, of course, I had, you know, I used the new one. Then whenever I, uh, whenever I see slippers, and I remember that moment that I was able to give away my slippers to that monk, and then he was really happy with that. And whenever, even now, I, when I remember that, I feel such a joy. You know, even now I can, I, when I talk about it, I feel such a joy. So I was really happy with my shoe because it was also comfortable for me. 
I was enjoying the comfort, you know, the pleasurable experience, you know, the pleasurable, you know, physical sensation I had with that shoe. But the joy I got by giving away that shoe, that slippers is far uh, advanced, far, into, uh, far advanced than the pleasure I will get with that, uh, uh, experience, that, uh, that slipper. So I mean, you may have such experiences too, like maybe you can, maybe you can think about a time that maybe you prepare your own meal, you prepare your own lunch, you purposely prepare that, you know, with all your favorite, you know, uh, you know things. And then uh, you, you're thinking about, I will have my, you know, lunch today. And then maybe you met someone, you know, your colleague or someone who haven't brought the lunch. And you decided to share your lunch with others. Maybe you were able to like buy lunch for someone, you know. And um, so you eating your favorite food gives you sensual pleasure. But sometimes sharing our favorite food with someone else can give us a deep level of joy and happiness. And, and, the, and the, the pleasure that you'll get by eating your favorite food will be very pleasurable, but it will not give you a happiness or joy afterwards. Uh, and afterwards you can, okay, you, I mean, how many such delicious meals you have eaten in your life? Can you think about them and you still feel happy? Sometimes most delicious, you know, things we ate may not be healthy. <laughs> You'll be very pleasurable when you are eating it, but after you ate it, you feel guilty that you, <laughs> you ate, you know, uh, unhealthy food. So you are pleasurable, you are happy at the time you are doing it, but later you, there's not much chance that you can be happy. But when you share your meal with someone, and even later when you think about it, still it can give you such a joy and happiness to, to us. So that is, that is more like a deeper level of happiness, happiness or generosity. And uh, there are also other forms of happiness and, and particularly you can also think about uh, happiness of um, um, moral behavior. The happiness that comes from seal. Uh, that, that is also a deeper level of happiness that you know if you um, manage to follow your precepts. And let's say you, you had uh, maybe in a full moon day or maybe on a Vesak day, maybe on a special day, you observed eight precepts and you try to follow that, you know, precepts throughout the day. And maybe even the evening you, you know, have your usual hunger, but you keep drinking without eating and you just want to stick into your precepts and you somehow manage with all the difficulties. And when you complete the whole day, the next day when you think about the day you spent, and you feel quite contented and you can rejoice the, the, the moral, ethical day that you spend. You feel kind of purity of your conduct. You know, maybe you, one day you, you maybe you will even observe in the five precepts. And one day you get an opportunity to tell a lie. I mean, if you tell a lie, you could have been, you should have a lot of advantages. Just tell one lie, you'll be saved from a lot of troubles, you'll get a lot of profit, you know, and then you get that opportunity. You know that no one will find out, I just had to tell this lie, it will be very advantageous to me. Okay, and now you are just about to tell the lie. And then you suddenly remember, oh, you know, I'm supposed to follow the five precepts. And you remember that, okay, you thought, okay, even though this, this can be very disadvantageous, uh, I'm going to stick into my precept. And then you didn't tell the lie. You tell the truth and you, it will be very disadvantageous. Uh, but you tell the truth. And then after a while, when you think about, you know, you can say, oh, I'm so happy about myself. I was able to somehow, you know, be, be truthful, you know, be honest. And even though there are such opportunity for me to have a lot of profits and advantages, when you think about it later, it can give us such a different kind of joy and contentment. And, and we can have such a, you know, moments of joy when, when you follow, when you have that you know, uh, moral behavior. So it, that is the other kind of happiness that we can get. Uh, and also like sometime, you know, when we, um, when we live our life, you know, we uh, fulfill different roles in our life. You know, you can be a mother, you can be a father, you can be a, 
uh, you know, responsible person in your uh, society, in your workplace. We have different roles in different times. Sometimes uh, following this role is not easy. You have to f do a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifices. And of course, as a mother, as a parent, you sacrifice a lot of your personal pleasures to you know, be a good mother, you know. And you know, you, you skip your favorite places to visit and you, you just go to places that your children like to visit, right? You may have, you, you may have gone there a hundred times. It's very boring. But if your children like it, you will go there, right? And you sacrifice a lot of your personal pleasures to fulfill your role as a mother, as a father, or as a, you know, other, you know, uh, person. So fulfilling our roles, our duties of our role can also give us a deeper levels of happiness later. When you think about, you know, how I dedicated myself to fulfill this role, to fulfill my duty to, to for, the, for the benefit of others, maybe your family, maybe your other friends, maybe other for large community. When you think about it, and that can also give you a different kind of joy. It may not be as exciting as ele yeah, like elation, but it's more like a more steady state of you know um, peace, a steady, a steady state of contentment. But more deeper level of happiness comes actually through really finding the way to make our mind wholesome and calm. And the uh, one such happiness would be uh, happiness of loving kindness. Happiness of loving kindness. When you develop this state of the mind that you genuinely wish well-being to all the living beings and, and that uh, and it, it, we had to develop that, you know, mind for some time. Like, you know, we had to, when we practice that, you know, uh, wishing of well-being towards all living beings. And you keep wishing that well-being, maybe every day, maybe, you know, um, on a regular basis. When you do that continuously, we develop such a mind that, um, that you, um, your mind become a mind that you have no enemies in your life. In uh, Metta Sutta, do you chant Metta Sutta here? Yeah, in the Metta Sutta, towards the end of the Metta Sutta, there's an interesting term called Asapattu. Um, the, when, uh, the, towards the end of the Metta Sutta, we are, we are Buddha described, actually towards the end of the Metta Sutta, uh, what you find is the benefits of practicing uh, loving kindness. Benefits of practicing loving kindness. And one benefit uh, is actually becoming asapatto. So, sapatta means with enemies. Asapatto means without enemies. Oh, so, you become a person that you don't find anyone in this world that you think as an enemy. Other may, <laughs> it's not something to do with others, but in, in our own mind, there could be people who have hurt you. There could be people who are not friendly with you. There could be people that who may not, you know, happy with you. That's up to them. But in your mind, when you think about, even, even though about those unfriendly people, and you develop this ability, even though they are unfriendly, I just want them to be okay. They are simply, you know, still practicing. They are still victims of their own defilements. And, and they, are, they, are, they are blinded. They don't have enough light. They don't have enough understanding. You know, then you just wish, you know, may they have some path to awaken. May they have some guidance to, you know, uh, change. But I just want them to be well. I just want them to be okay. So we can develop such a mind. I'm sorry, it's not easy. But when you keep practicing, and you develop such a mind that there's no one who can disturb you. Normally, you know, in our ordinary life, if you don't practice life, I mean, no, in our ordinary life, there are people when you think about them, we feel so happy. And we become so light, you know, uh, bright, we become so elated when you think about certain people. They are kind people, nice people, people who help us. 
family, friends, when you think about them, you know, our, 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 our face shines. But there are other people, when you think about them, oh, our face becomes frowned. When you remember them, oh, it's, it's not something we are happy. When you heard their name, oh, not something. When you see their photos, oh, it's like, <laughs> so there can be some, some people, even they are not in front of us. But whenever we remember them, whenever we see, see their photo, when they, some other people mention about them, there is a disturbance, disturbance happening within us. Those people have nothing to do with that. You know, maybe they have hurt us before. Those people live somewhere else, far away from us. But whenever we think about them, whenever we remember them, whenever other people talk about them, we can have a disturbance within ourselves. So that means our mind, so there are people that, that can you know, disturb us, actually, not actually people, there are, there are still our mind has this tendency that these memories, these images of other people can disturb our peace and disturb us and make us unhappy. You know, and they may have even forgotten us, right? But in our mind, when we think about them, that is enough for us to be unhappy for half an hour, sometimes even an hour. And sometimes even more than that, right? And, and, and so we keep thinking about it, we keep thinking about all the hurts they have done it, we think about all the, uh, the bad speech uh, they have done, and then we keep repeating and thinking about them, and we can be unhappy. But if we keep on developing loving kindness, and we are actually making this transformation in our mind, even though we remember the people who have hurt us, hurt us, people who have cheated us, people who have you know, betrayed us. We develop this ability to look at them in a deeper sense, more with, with deeper understanding that everyone is actually vulnerable. Everyone is victims of their own limited understanding, on their own habitual patterns, on their own defilements. And they keep repeating this habit, not only towards me, you know, whatever hurt, whatever betrayal, whatever lies that they have you know, uh, told us, is, is, I'm not the only one that they have done, this to, done, done these unwholesome things. That is their habit. They keep doing it to many. And as a result, they may receive consequences. They may, have, and they may accumulate bad karma, and they may have all the consequences, and you know, they are having that their journey. And you develop this deep understanding towards them. And you become someone different from them. Right? There's a story that you know, um, one um, meditative monk saw a um, uh, scorpion. You know, you know a scorpion? Yeah. The scorpion is struggling in the water uh, and he wants to sail. So, out of compassion, <laughs> He took this uh, uh, scorpion and, you know, placed him in the ground. And of course, a scorpion, what do you call it? Stink. Stink. It was so painful. But he was not angry. Because he knew that it's a scorpion, it was, it's, it's out of fear, you know. He didn't know, he didn't know that, you know, this monk was saving him. So it was so painful, but he was still okay because now he is saved. The other monk was watching. And this scorpion, out of foolishness, again walking, walking, running, running, moving, again went to the water. <laughs> and this monk was again feel compassion for the scorpion. With all the pain he had, is again he wanted to save that scorpion and place them again on the ground. So he did this three times. And every time he was stunk. And the other monk came and told him, Venerable sir, <laughs> Are you not hurt? Why you keep doing it? He keeps stinking you. Why you want to keep, keep doing it? And he told the monk, it is the nature of the scorpion to stink. It is the nature of the scorpion to, scorpion to stink, but it, it is my nature to help and serve. So because he stinked, I'm not going to change my nature. Because my nature, my habit, my practice is to save and help. It is the nature of the scorpion to sting. 
So what to do? It's a natural scorpion and he's fearful, he's afraid, he's self-defensive, he's not enough knowledge, he's not, he's he doesn't have enough understanding to save his life. It is the nature of the scorpions to stink. So we, you can have so many scorpions <laughs> in your life, nature is to stink. But because of their nature to stink, you don't have to stink them. You don't have to like, you know, bite them. You have to protect our nature, which is the, you know, uh, the compassion in nature that we want to practice. Of course, there can be more skillful ways to, you know, save the scorpion without using the hand. That could be the more, you know, skillful way, a like smart way to save them without being stunk. So sometimes when you want to help other people, maybe you have to find a smart way to help them, not to, not to be always deceived or not to be, you know, hurt. You have to find some smart way. But importantly, we need to understand that, you know, just because other people have these bad habits, other people have this habit of cheating and hurting others, we should not be affected or change our good nature because of their bad nature. So practicing loving kindness continuously on a daily basis can create such a mind that even though you remember people who hurt you, that will not disturb you. That will develop, that will give you more kind of compassion and empathy and more understanding that this is the nature of human mind. And this is the nature of human mind. This is the nature of a scorpion. And you develop understanding about human nature. And then, so no matter who you remember, no matter who you see, that will not disturb your mind. Imagine that we develop such a mind through our practice of loving kindness. We are not going to change the world. We are not going to change other people. You know, we are not going to you know, change other people's habit of lying or cheating or you know, hurting. But you are going to change your mind, how you see them, how you respond to them. And, and you can develop such a mind. That is what Metta Sutta is saying, you know. So Buddha has said that because it is possible. It will take some time. It will take some practice. It's called becoming asapatto. Becoming someone that no one can disturb our mind. <laughs> becoming someone there's no enemy. There's no, uh, uh, there's no one who, who, will dist who can disturb the peace of your mind. So that is the deeper joy and happiness we can develop through practicing of loving kindness. That is coming from meditation. Of course, when you practice loving kindness in a very concentrated manner, whenever you can feel that loving kindness in your heart, you genuinely generate this wish. Sometime at the beginning, you don't feel like wishing well-being to all people because you know that there are some people who are, who are not nice. As some people are, have so many discrimination, so you don't, you may not feel like wishing well-being at the beginning, but you know <laughs> uh, the the one method is actually we don't wait until we feel like wishing well-being. You just start wishing. You may not feel like, but you just follow the instruction advice. You simply wish may all beings be well and happy. You keep wishing it. You may not feel it, but you keep wishing it. And the more you wish, and maybe you also uh, develop uh, this uh, understanding, and you also use some wisdom, the, the, when you keep doing it, there will be one point that you feel, oh, you will have the feeling. It is like, you know, when you, sometimes when you, uh, when you uh, smile, you don't feel like smiling. You know, you don't feel like smiling, but you can f smile fakely, <laughs> right? And just, you know, <laughs> stretch your mouth. But when you keep doing it, and there'll be one time you'll be actually smile. <laughs> so we said, you know, I mean, there's some statements that fake it until you make it, you know. But it's, it's, it's not really doing, it's not a dishonest thing, but, you know, there's, you know, even in, in therapy, uh, for depressed people, uh, the therapists are telling them, okay, have a gentle smile, just, 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 you know, flat mouth, you know, gentle smile. And because they are not used to it, when you make that shape of the mouth with our muscle memory, and it will send a signal to our brain and we will actually have, <laughs> we will have actual smile as a result of that. 
So the same way, we may not feel like wishing well-being to all people, all beings. But when you simply say it, following the structure, following the, you know, um, the, the method of the loving kindness meditation, when you keep saying it, maybe 10 times, by the eight times, you may generate the feeling. And when you have that genuine feeling that you develop this genuine willingness, how good if everyone is okay? How good if everyone is fine? If everyone is out of trouble? How good? And you, have, you generate that feeling also when you keep wishing that. That feeling that you are genuinely having this goodwill, this wish of benevolence. And when you have that gen actual feeling, it is such a joy. It gives, it of course changes your whole physiology, definitely. It releases dopamine, right? and, and it releases the do dopamine, and, and it really relaxes your whole muscles and the body. You get a whole different physical experience as a result of that. There are so many other benefits too. But that is the kind of joy that we can develop. So that joy is not dependent on anyone else. You don't have, not everyone has to be nice to make that wish. People will be still not nice, but you can still make this wish for them to be nice. <laughs> you know, for them to be well, for, for them to be happy. And so that wish, you can do it by yourself. And, and that is under your control. And then as a result, and you may, when you do it long enough, you have this access to deeper joy and happiness. And it is under your control. When you want that happiness, just sit down and make this, repeat these wishes a few times and do this meditation or a formal way or just in, in your couch or wherever, in your even driving seat. And just do it, you know, many times, just repeat that wishes. When you want that happiness, that joy, and there will be a point, you will get that joy. So, and even that joy can also influence others. Like, you know, maybe sometimes we, in order for us to be happy, we wait for other people uh, to compliment us, or we, we wait for other people to be nice to us, then we'll be happy. So in this practice, maybe we don't wait other people to be nice, we become nice. We don't wait other people to smile with us. We smile first. When we smile first, oh, they will also change. Sometimes they have forgotten to smile because they are going through a lot of troubles and pain. And when you, when you, have, when you have this you know, mindfulness uh, to smile, you start the smile. Don't wait until other people smile. Start you. Be proactive. Smile first. And then others will smile. You know, uh, uh, and I remember, you know, one day uh, uh, in in Pittsburgh, we were traveling to Ohio. You know, uh, we have other branch temple in Ohio. Uh, so I was going with the other American uh, uh, friend, a devotee, and he was driving the car. We had to, you know, pump gas, you know, uh, uh, to our car. So we stopped in the gas station. You know. Uh, what do you call here? Gas station, right? Petrol station. Huh? Petrol station, yeah. We stopped uh, in the petrol station in the highway. We came out. And so the, uh, we, you know, we get out from the car. We were pumping the gas. And there was a lady who was actually just about to finish the, you know, pumping the gas. And she was just looking at us because I'm in my robe, right? So it's a very strange thing. So, the, so automatically she will look at me. So as soon as she looked at me, so I just smile. <laughs> and you know, this is our habit, right? So, so and for Western people, smiling is, is, is not something they are familiar with, you know. So they will talk, they will say, oh, how are you? And they will talk, but they will not necessarily smile. It's, it's, uh, and they are, their muscles are not very much trained to smile. <laughs> they have a special reason to smile. They will talk to you, but they will not necessarily smile. So whenever that young lady you know, look at me, I just smile, and then she also gently smile, <clears throat> and and that was that. And then <clears throat> and and then she stopped. She finished the uh, pumping the gas, and then and I saw that you know she is driving one whole because she was a little bit far in the other you know pump, 
and she was now coming to our our place. I was thinking, oh, oh did that is did something wrong? <laughs> She's coming to uh, our place, and then and then she stopped the car in, in near our car, and he raised her window down, and said that, thank you for that smile. I really needed it today. I was so touched, you know. I just, I just smiled out of the habit, you know. But for her, that was like a big change because maybe some positive encounter, and she that you know, I needed it today. So, so initiating our smile can actually, you know, change other people's mind and you know create, you know, this positive nature in in others. So instead of waiting other people to smile with us, we can start smiling and definitely many people will also smile back at you and many people also remember to smile and that is contagious. Our smile, our positive positivity is contagious. So you can actually you know, create a whole positive environment in any place by simply you know, going there. Even you go to a you know, coffee shop, you know, <laughs> even to your workplace, you know, just where I smile. <laughs> Maybe just, you know, go with a smile and when other people see you, you know, uh, and some people may not necessarily smile, but that is, that is making a positive impact on other people. And it definitely make you <laughs> happy when you do that. So that is, those are the, you know, simple, you know, ways that we can actually generate uh, more inner joy. So smiling is, uh, is up to you. Is under your control because you, you know, these muscles under under your control, right? So of course we have to have a feeling to do that. But I mean, you don't have to wait others to smile to smile. We can start it, and it's under your control. Whenever you do it, this and that will bring uh, joy and happiness to you. But that is not the only joy and happiness we are capable of having. There are deeper and deeper levels of joy that we can have. It. I would like to, you know. Uh, refer to another sutta. This is called Aranya Sutta. You know, the Aranya means uh, wilderness, uh, the forest. And this happened in the forest. Uh, in, this is in the Sang Sangvita Nikaya. They are actually <coughs> uh, 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 a deity, uh, uh, a tree deity, a divine being, came to the Buddha and make a comment, or actually ask a question about the monks that he has seen in that forest. Yeah, he, he, this, this divine being, this deity, this deva has this question. This is the question. He said that those who abide in this forest, peaceful, live in this holy life, and they eat only a single meal, why is their face is so calm? And so this deity is asking, you know, they are living in this very simple you know, uh, uh, frugal, uh, they are living this simple environment. They only even eat single meal. And in those days, many monks only went out for one time, so they had, you know, one single meal. So uh, the, particularly maybe those monks, because you can observe uh, additionally, you know, wow, to eat only once a day. You know, that's, you know, in addition to our normal uh, discipline, you, there are also optional, you know, uh, vows we can make. So, so maybe those monks were having only you know, one, one meal a day. So his question is that they are living this very frugal life, not much you know, you know, comfort, but why their face is so calm? You know, why their faces are so pleasant? That was the question. And then Buddha answered. This is the answer. They do not grieve over the past. No, they do yearn for the future. They live only in the present. That is why their face is so calm. So they don't worry about, you know, what happened in the past. And they don't, you know, uh, yearn for the future. They live only in the present moment. Therefore, their face is so calm, so pleasant. Uh, uh, it is, and then and the further said that it is from yearning for the future and from grieving over the past that is how fools become withered like a fresh fresh reed that is being hacked down that means um, you know the um, the when the, the fresh reeds 
when you cut from the you know, bottom and after maybe uh, uh, half a day or day, all this fresh you know, um, uh, green uh, reeds will become withered and have less energy and become, you know, lose all the vibrance and everything. So Buddha said that <laughs> the unwise people from yearning for the future and from grieving over the past become withered like those, you know, the reeds that are cut from the root. But these monks have such a you know, pleasant, vibrant look because of their practice of not uh, grieving over the past and not yearning for the future. But th this doesn't mean that you forget the past. You can't do it. This doesn't mean that you don't think at all about the future. We have to plan and set goals and, you know, uh, and plan. But this is actually like grieving over the past is different from you know, thinking about the past. You know, we can learn lessons from the past, but keep worrying and regretting and grieving again and again and again about the past is different from remembering and learning from the past. And planning and, uh, and preparing for the future is different from yearning and imagining, fantasizing, and you know, imagining the worst about the future. That is different. So those monks are not doing that. And th that doesn't mean that they are completely, you know, uh, stop thinking about the past or future, but they are not simply yearning or fantasizing or imagining the worst about the future. And they are not also unnecessarily worrying, keep, you know, uh, worrying about the past. And they mostly live in the present. That is why their face is so, you know, serene. So, that is the joy, happiness we can get through deeper meditation. When we practice meditation and learn to calm our mind and learn to uh, settle our mind on a selected object, could be breath, could be loving kindness, could be qualities of the Buddha, as a result we withdraw our attention from external world to in inward, an inward drawing of the attention. And you settle your mind, attention on that selected object. As a result of that, our running, our mind running from object to object, running from here to there, is gone. It is now settled, and it is so serene and peaceful. And your your whole body is changed as a result of that. When our mind is growing from one object to the other, one object to the other, we become excited or we become resentful because we like something, we dislike something. Any time we become excited, our body, our muscles get changed. When you become resentful, unhappy, disgusted about something, your muscles also react to that. So all the time, our body is like, you know, like a roller coaster. And, and our, our muscles are always like, you know, uh, really ten, tense, to being tensed and being responding to those different mental states. But when you can draw your attention inward and settle your mind in a wholesome object or a neutral object like breath, that fluctuation is gone. Now your body doesn't have to deal with ups and downs. And your muscles start to relax gradually. And your mind is not moving here and there. It can now rest. So the, then you can develop deeper joy, what we call piti and sukha. And, and piti is the meditative joy you will get. And then also physical, deep physical relaxation you will get. And it's a completely different kind of joy. It is felt not only in the mind, it's also felt in the body. Because your, all the muscles in your body is, will be relaxed. And as a result, you will come to a point that you will not feel even the weight of your body. Right now, you are sitting in a comfortable posture, but still you feel the kind of weight of the body, right? Our shoulders are heavy, <laughs> our skull is heavy, you know, we are bent. So we still feel the tense muscles, sometimes the heaviness of the body. You know, we always carry this body, right? So there's a burden, there's a heaviness in this body. But when you achieve that kind of concentration, subtle stillness of your mind, all the muscles get loosened up and you start to feel, you, you even do not feel the weight of the body. You feel like almost like a cotton. Like, oh, you feel like your whole body is like a transparent, 
like a cloud. And, the, and the, in, it is explained in the suttas uh, with a nice simile. Actually, in the Buddha said that, you know, this, um, the, the bliss that you can experience in this meditation is like you are in the bathtub full of foam. Your whole body is touched the, by this, this soft touch of this foam. There's no part in your body that is not, not touched by that, you know, uh, comfortable sensation. So, so Buddha is giving that example. Have you been in a bathtub full of foam? I don't know, I haven't been, but you know, I mean, maybe you have this facility at your home, right? Sometimes you have a really relaxed day, relaxed evening, you know, you will, you know, create your bathtub and have all the nice, you know, aromatic foam and create that foam, you know, and then you, you know, jump there and then stay in there, you know, until your neck, and you be there. I'm, when I read this example, I was thinking, how did the Buddha know about this bathtub? I thought we recently invented them, you know. But then later I remember, oh, he was a prince. He had palaces, he had three palaces for three different seasons. His father could have, you know, prepared this bathtub for him. So that is why he knew about it, right? He's giving a very simple uh, mundane example to explain the kind of bliss, kind of relaxation, kind of comfort you will get in the meditation. Like each, each part of your body, Feel that relaxation, feel that lightness. The every muscle is relaxed in that deep stage of samadhi. We call samadhi sukha, you know, that joy that comes from samadhi. And the, the, the example is that. So we have the capacity to experience that kind of joy also. And it is deep, de inner joy, inner happiness that we can get. It's not dependent on any other person. It's only dependent on our own effort and our own commitment. It's gently calming down our mind. It's, it's not something we can experience at once, but gradually, 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 we can uh, calm down our mind. And initially, we experience that relaxation almost like you know some tingling ex experience in the body. The beginning of that experience is that you feel like you know there's tingling. You know there's a, you feel like you know ants are moving around your body. That's how you start. But when you continue to calming your mind, and then you will feel that complete relaxation, lightness of the body and the mind. And that is samadhi, the joy that we get from samadhi, you know, the, the tranquil, the still state of the mind. And of course, there are also other happiness, but Buddha was not, Buddha did not stop there, because that is also temporary in the sense that we can have that deep joy, but only we are only in the meditation, but when you come out, you lose that joy. But then Buddha used um, the, our wisdom and insight uh, to, to create such a mind that even when you come out from that meditation, and because you can now understand the nature of every sensory stimulus, you know that every sensory stimulus is temporary, and then you develop this ability to, to notice every, everything that we encounter and not be fooled by them, understand the impermanence, you will experience them, but don't take them so seriously. And you are able to, you know, keep your mind almost, almost like a mind of, uh, you know, like, you know, when uh, the example is given is that when you put water into a lotus leaf, have you seen the lotus leaf? When you put water, yeah, it is there, but it will not get the, you know, the leaf salt, right? So we, uh, through the vipassana, through this insight, wisdom, we can develop a mind that we still live in the world. We see beautiful things, ugly things, pleasant things, unpleasant things. And, but we encounter everything, but you can create a mind just like this lotus leaf that, you know, you are not being sought. <laughs> You're not being, you know, uh, affected by those things. Uh, though that is the deeper happiness that we get as a result of, you know, uh, developing our wisdom and insight. So these are the possibilities that we, we all, these are the capacity that we all have. And therefore, there's such a deeper realm of happiness that we can explore, we can go. So that shows that how the happiness that we get from sensual place is how limited it is. It is only a very little kind of happiness, but the other deeper levels of happiness that we can develop through our meditation, through our practice, through our moral behavior, through our Dhamma practices, much, much higher than that. So, 
the Buddhist path is actually joyful path. It's not the suffering path, you know. It's overcoming the suffering, but very practice also uh, have this joy, joy and elements of joy and happiness along the way. So I wish that may we all have the opportunity to experience all these different levels of joy and happiness within. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or Bhante? Good evening, Bhante. Um, can I ask a question? Um, yes. Just now, Bhante talked about the joy from meditation, uh, the samadhi part. Uh, how about from insight? Can you give examples of joy coming from inside? Inside, yeah. Thank you. Actually, there's a name for that also. It's called Sambodha Sukha. Sambodha Sukha. So, the happiness that we get from Samadhi is called Vupasama Sukha, like a happiness of tranquility. Sambodha is come from Bodhi, you know, like Sambodha. Sambodha Sukha means happiness of insight, happiness of understanding. Um, it is, maybe if I give an example, of course it comes in the meditative, deeper meditative states. But if I give you a very mundane example, um, uh, it is like, you know, we have learned the Dhamma and we know that how, you know, craving generates suffering. We also learn how we can use our mindfulness not to let those, you know, craving urges overcome us and then and then and and then we can we can use our mindfulness to stop that so we have learned we have learned a lot of dhamma uh, as theory you know as you know uh, we call right understanding but through our meditation through our constant practice there can be moments that we personally directly experience what you have learned before so there's those are the moments of direct experience you have learned that craving creates suffering, but how you experience it, <laughs> like how you directly experience it. Maybe one day, one day you have such, you know, really, I really want to, you know, uh, want that. You know, uh, you see something in the billboard, and then you really develop this craving. And then, and then you, and then you start feeling, how, how uncomfortable am I? And, and you realize, that, oh, oh, this is exactly how, you know, craving creates suffering. I was so happy, I was so content, I had no idea about this, whatever this new object, new thing, you know, new, you know, new version or thing, thing, but as soon as I saw it, and that desire came to me, and now I'm yearning for it, I feel like without it, I'm, I, I cannot be, and you reflect and, re and directly experience, oh, oh, this is how craving creates suffering. So we, we can call them aha moments. Yeah. So those moments you realize that, ah, ah, this is what Buddha had taught. This is what I have learned before, but now I'm directly experiencing it. So those are, the, of course, those are the, you know, like a, uh, learning from the bad experiences. But there are also good experiences that sometimes when you directly experience the impermanence. We have learned about the impermanence. But in deeper meditation, you can directly experience. The, how we can experience impermanence is actually uh, directly seeing, experiencing, arising and passing. Arising and passing. That is how we experience the impermanence. So in the deeper meditative experience, when you can, maybe you, you feel we have a sensation, pleasurable sensation, or maybe painful sensation, or maybe you hear a sound or whatever, and you directly experience the beginning of that experience, the arising of it, developing it, coming to a peak, and then slowly dissolving that. If you can stay focused throughout that whole process, how that experience occurs, and then how it disappears, you directly experience impermanence, and that is a whole different understanding, not the conceptual understanding. When you directly experience it, it becomes, aha, this is what, you know, impermanence is and those are the moments of you know kind of joy when you directly experience it and of course as a result 
and when you come out of the meditation and then you can maintain such a state of the mind that no, no, not many changes can disturb you because we have experienced it, we have accepted it. So you develop a kind of resilient mind as a result. And so it also gives you a more steady uh, peace uh, even out, out of the meditation. But in deeper meditative context, we get aha moments and directly experiencing what you have learned before and you are personalizing it, you are directly realizing it and that is a joy of understanding. But they, yes. what, what does it take to reach the jhanas? What are our practice for lay people? Um, it's, it's actually the gradual practice, definitely. Mm. So, uh, it is something that usually you take, you need some continuous effort, practice to, uh, practice to do it. So, May usually we experience such a you know a deep level of stillness in the in the retreats. Uh, maybe you know like when you attend the retreats, then you fully focus on that practice. You keep doing it, and as a result, you can you know uh, hit you know that kind of you know blissful states. But uh, having a regular practice on our daily basis can uh, uh, enhance the possibility or having such a peaceful state in the retreat context. If you don't have a regular practice, simply going to retreats and you know, trying it you know, within that few days will not help you to go all the way there. So I would say that you, it's nice to have a regular practice, even a short practice like you know, having loving kindness meditation or breathing meditation a few minutes a day, and then you are gradually training your mind to, you know, uh, to settle down and calm down. And when you go for a retreat and your mind is already prepared, already have training, and very easily we can you know experience such uh, peaceful states yeah. thank you